Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Um, well, um, morning, uh, welcome everybody, and it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Krishi Hassan from University of Wisconsin, Madison. And uh, I've known actually Krishi for quite a while now. I think when I was a grad school student at UW, and he was a grad student at San Diego, and I graduated there four or five years ago. Yes. Uh, with George Varghese, and today he's going to talk about some of the work he's done over the past uh, few years on improving deep packet inspection. Yeah, take it Thank away. Thank you, Ratu. Yeah. So, uh, okay, let me try presenting from here. They see the uh, cameras can see me here also. So, uh, th this is a uh, joint work with my colleague Samesh Jha and uh, my two students, uh, Randy Smith and uh, Xi Jin Kong. And uh, this uh, talk uh, summarizes uh, work that we, we, pre uh, we had in uh, SICCOM paper this year and then Oakland paper uh, earlier this year. So what, 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 what is this talk about? So let me, let me first uh, tell you what, what, what this talk is about. It's about uh, regular expression matching, uh, which is a performance critical uh, operation for all type of uh, systems that do deep packet inspection. And uh, the problem is that it takes uh, too much time and too much memory. So our solution to this problem is a new representation for these signature sets that need to be uh, compared uh, against, against the traffic. And it's a representation that allows us to represent these uh, signature sets compactly and supports fast matching. So, uh, for example, uh, compared to, uh, to methods uh, currently in use in, in commercial intrusion prevention systems, uh, we have uh, 50 times reduction and at the s in, in, in memory usage and at the same time a 10 times increase in, in, in the speed uh, of the matching operation. So not 50%, 50x. Uh, and, but but the, the magnitude of the benefits depends on the complexity of the signature set. So for simpler signature sets, we, we don't see benefits that are quite this big. So this is in a nutshell what, what, what this uh, talk is about. Uh, let me uh, go on uh, and, and, and motivate why, why we're working on this. So why do we need uh, deep packet inspection? So there are a couple of uh, scenarios that are uh, probably going to uh, keep uh, motivating this type of uh, solutions. So for example, you have a server uh, that, is, uh, that has a vulnerability and is not patched, but it has to accept uh, connections from, um, from outside clients, from, from, from anywhere in the internet. But some of those clients may, may, may trigger that, that vulnerability and want to take over the server or shut down the server or whatever. So, so why would you ever have an unpatched server facing the internet? Well, maybe the patch doesn't exist yet, or maybe the patch breaks some other functionality. So there are many reasons why you, you, why you could have such a server. So you put an intrusion prevention system before the server to protect it, and the server can, can keep running. Uh, <laughs> Another example is when you have a, 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 an enterprise. <laughs> Running, running multiple applications and the enterprise want to prioritize the traffic without having to change the applications to insert markings into the, into the packets. So, so that's another driver. Or when you have uh, floods that you need to defend against in the network because it's too late uh, at the endpoint, and you want to analyze packet contents to detect what's, what's an attack, what's not an attack. And th that's, that's, that's another case when you would want to do the packet inspection. Now, uh, packet header-based uh, filtering criteria have been applied and are still in use. But what we see in all of these problems is that you have to look inside the content of the packet. And for the purpose of this talk, I define deep packet inspection as, as uh, you know, being done by any system that looks at the payload of, of the IP or TCP uh, packets. So, uh, OK. So how does regular expression matching fit into this whole scenario? So not, not uh, all of what these systems do is deep packet inspection. They use this header-based uh, uh, criteria, for example, to, to decide what signature set to apply. Or if you have something that do, does application identification, then you do deep packet inspection on the first few packets of a flow. And from there on, you just look at packet headers because you already classify uh, the flows. 
Uh, so it's not all uh, not looking at uh, not necessarily looking at the payloads of all packets. And deep packet inspection is not all regular expression matching. You can have some parsing in there that would direct the regular expression matching just to some portions of the packets, not the entire packets. Or you may have some other things such as uh, decoding uh, various encodings for protocols. Uh, and in some cases, it, it, it plain doesn't apply. So if you have encrypted traffic, then you cannot do regular expression matching on it. You can decrypt it and then do regular expression matching, but not apply regular expression matching to encrypted traffic. I was wondering, do you know how many uh, enterprises are using IPsec either internally or how much of your traffic is IPsec? I don't know. Uh, when you talk about regular expression here, do you mean also like kind of crossing packet boundaries or you mean for like within a packet? So uh, for, for uh, we assume that someone gives us an input. And then whether the system gives us a single packet or reassembles multiple packets and gives us a TCP level uh, in a byte stream, uh, the same problem uh, appears. So that's, that's, that's external to, to what we do. But yes, uh, the systems that, that care about the security, they need to do reassembly because otherwise the bad guys can, can evade uh, the, the detection. So uh, just, just one more uh, historic uh, note that uh, string matching used to be used for, for a similar purpose, but, but it's not expressive enough. Just looking for strings in payload is not expressive enough. There, there are so many ways of just changing the attacks to full uh, string-based methods. So uh, the world is moving towards uh, like regular expressions now. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'll start by, by introducing the problem of regular expression matching, then talk a little bit about the core idea, then about the things we needed to do to turn it into a solution, show some results. And if we have time, uh, th then I can, I can talk a little bit about other ideas that have been used in this context of improving the memory usage or performance of this uh, critical operation of regular expression matching. So, uh, okay, what's, what's, what's our definition of a problem? So we have a signature set. Uh, a signature set, so what's a signature set? We have a list of, uh, a set of signatures. Each, are, each, is, each signature is a regular expression, and each regular expression has a rule number associated with it. And the matching problem we are solving is that we take all these uh, regular expressions and we want to uh, be able to tell the rest of the system when any of these rules matches. And we want to find uh, all of the matches and uh, we want to know which of the rules match, not just that one of the rules matched. And we detect matches in the middle of the, the, the stream also. So that's what that um, uh, prefix of the input matches part means. So, so uh, if a signature matches in the middle of the packet, then, then we also uh, have, have an alert. Now, this is... Uh, Pretty much the same problem as taking those uh, regular expressions and then oring them together and then just recognizing the combined regular expression. It has these tiny differences, but that's, that's, that's the fundamental problem that we are uh, looking at. So, well, people have, <laughs> have been uh, looking at regular languages and regular expressions for a long time. So, so let's not just uh, launch into, into uh, you know, hacking a solution together. Let's look at, at what we know from theory. So we know that finite automata are the simplest machines that can recognize regular uh, languages. And uh, so anything else that recognizes regular languages, uh, so, so we don't need anything more complex than a simple deterministic finite automaton to recognize whether an input match is part of a regular language or no. We also know that there exists a canonical minimal DFA and no automaton uh, can recognize correctly uh, the language, a given language, uh, with fewer automaton states than the number of states of the minimal DFA. So does it mean that uh, whatever we do, we cannot have uh, use less memory than this uh, minimal DFA? Uh, that's, that's, that's not a correct conclusion, and, and uh, I hope it will become uh, obvious why. <coughs> Uh, and uh, does this mean that we use, if you use anything other than DFAs, it will be slower because we use something more complex? Uh, actually, that's uh, not true either, and, and we will get into um, explaining uh, why that is so in, in a few minutes. So let me just, 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 just a refresher, just go through what a DFA is and, and, and how it works. So this uh, automaton with, with the, the five states, PQ, RST, 
is a data structure that is used during matching uh, to recognize the signature dot star AB dot star CD, which basically is a string AB followed at any distance by a string uh, CD. So the way, the way this works is that we have a pointer pointing to the current state. So note that uh, the automaton itself doesn't tell you anything about the, the relation uh, of the, the input to the, to the signature, how well it matches. Uh, but this pointer describes uh, the, the, the state of the computation. So how the input seen so far relates to the, to the signature. So once we have this pointer to the current state, which is initialized to the start state, we go through characters one by one. So here I'm using the, uh, the, the, the um, convention used in, in, uh, by many of the intrusion prevention systems. So square brackets with, with caret A means all characters uh, other than A. And uh, these transition tables are just large tables, and you index into them with the actual character, and you always have a transition for the next character. So we get an A, we get a B with each state R, we get an, well, E and F will keep us there. OK, we see the C, D, and we reach uh, an accepting state, the DFA accepts, and then we notify the rest of the system that we have a match. And then we uh, continue because we want to find uh, all matches. Now, uh, in, in many of the figures, I will use uh, simplified representations without all the transitions, but, but uh, all, all the automata, we, we just want exceptions. Uh, one exception. All the automata in this talk are deterministic and they have all, all the transitions defined. Uh, yeah, just a footnote, I think. Uh, that's not quite correct, right? Because if you get A, A, B, E, F, C, D, O, Q would have a, Q should have an extra transition to itself if, it's, uh, if it gets A. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. So I'm, I'm, I'm cutting corners. I'm not putting all the transitions. And, and I will keep doing that throughout the talk because it gets hairy. <laughs> so uh, what, what is the problem? So if you have two signatures like this and we want to combine them, that, that, then we can do that. And we have a single automaton that recognizes both signatures at the same time. So uh, with uh, this combined automaton, we have a single state pointer, and it tracks the progress in matching both signatures. So if after GAB, we, we uh, transition to, to uh, a state that indicates that we have CNAB, so that's progress in matching the first signature. After EF, we transition to a state that indicates that, that we made some progress to both first, uh, on, on both first uh, and the second signature. And after we see the CD, we uh, arrive in this uh, final uh, in this accepting state, and then uh, we alert for signature one, and then later on we may alert again for signature one or for signatures two. So we have a single data structure describing both signatures, but the problem is that this is a, a large one. So if we have n such signatures, we, we need at least uh, two to the n states for the combined automaton. So are the examples carefully picked because the signatures are actually non overlapping in this case? So what if the signatures are overlapping? So, if, for example, if you have AB and you know, dot star AB or dot star ABD. Uh, so, uh, if if the signatures are um, with dot star AB, dot star ABD, you get the same type of explosion. You cannot get away from this two, uh, two to the power n. Uh, some some examples may be uh, some of the, the 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 automata may become messier, but you don't, you don't get away from the, 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 the exponential state space explosion because of overlapping those strings. So, so another way to say coding is, can you actually not optimize just because you actually have overlapping signatures? Because you're already, so think of it as the like, signature having you know, a smaller sort of fragment that you can match for both the signatures or set of n signatures. Yes. Now you can say, I've already matched you know, a subset of my bigger match. Can I now you know, essentially use that as, as a building block and essentially optimize on that? Um, uh, pl pl please wait on you know, five or six more slides and, 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 and let me know if, if, if what I'm going to present is, is what you had in mind. So uh, basically, uh, why, why do we have this state space explosion? Because at any point in time, 
we need to know if we see uh, the second string of any of the signatures, we need to know whether to accept or no. So we need to know whether we have seen the, previous, uh, the first part of the signature or no. And we need to know that for all signatures. So there are many possible interleavings. And we, we need a separate automaton state that would represent that we haven't seen the first string of any of the signatures, or we have seen it just for the first, or just for the second, or the first and the second, or just for the third, and so on. So it's an exponential number of combinations that the computation needs to differentiate between. And a DFA, the only way to distinguish between two things is to have a separate uh, automaton uh, state. So uh, now, OK, this is problematic. So, so, so people obviously haven't been building DFAs that are exponential in size because they wouldn't fit in the memory of any uh, device. So what, 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 have, uh, what approaches have uh, been used? So one solution is to just match the signatures in, in, in parallel. And now, the downside of that is that in, instead of just having one pointer that you keep to, uh, updating on every input byte, you have multiple pointers, so your throughput goes down. Uh, or you need to spend more, more processors, more cores on, on achieving uh, the, the throughput that, that you desire. Uh, another solution is to combine them, but not trigger a big exponential explosion, but just control it somehow. So combine just subsets of the signature set, and then you can control the, the explosion. And you, you don't have, uh, and depending on how much memory you have, you can use more or fewer uh, automata. Now, uh, what, what, uh, does, does any of this contradict uh, the, uh, the theory? So, so how can we match a signature set with fewer automaton states, like when using separate automata, than, than uh, the number of states of the minimal DFA? So is there any contradiction here? Uh, there, there isn't, because the state of the computation uh, still has many, many possible values. Uh, but the number of automaton states, which is the data structure we use for recognizing it, uh, is, is, is not as large. So here, the state of the computation, if you use multiple automata, is just a tuple with all the pointers for all the automata. And that can still have a very large number of values. We just don't have a separate uh, data structure uh, with, with, with all those uh, big transition tables for, for, for every possible state of uh, the computation. So this is, this is what we see with, with uh, methods uh, currently in use today. We can have separate uh, DFAs for each signature, which is uh, slow. Uh, or we can have a single DFA, which is fast, but uses a lot of memory. And there's a curve uh, in between that we can uh, uh, move on uh, by, by, by controlling the number of, of uh, DFAs that we combine. But this is not what we want. We want to get uh, in, in that ideal spot there. We want the same memory as the separate signatures, and we want matching to be no slower than it would take to just match a single signature. And actually, for, uh, for string matching, uh, which was used before your expression matching, we had exactly this behavior. You just added more strings, no state space explosion, your automaton becomes bigger, but your matching isn't any, any slower. So uh, let me tell you about how, how we uh, achieve this. And, and uh, then we will go into other topics. So again, some transitions are missing. <laughs> uh, uh, but, but, but this is what we do. We have uh, this extended finite automata XFAs where we extend uh, the underlying automaton with a little bit of uh, scratch memory, in this case a variable called bit that can have uh, two values, true and false. And we add some uh, programs to the, to the attach some programs to some of the automaton uh, states. So how, how does uh, this work? Uh, why, why does this work? Uh, by adding these bits and this extra computation, we have automata whose shape is closer to the shape of automata that do string matching. So these don't have those, those bad properties that we are trying to run away from. And, uh, but we still can recognize the same language because we have these extra checks. So this automaton is the same as an automaton that would recognize an AB and a CD just totally independently. Uh, so uh, at initialization, we don't just initialize the state pointer, but we initialize the value of the bit. So now the state of the computation is that pointer to an automaton state and the value of the bit. And then on every character, we keep uh, following transitions. And we, we don't touch this, this scratch memory that holds uh, these variables, the bit until uh, we get to a state that has a program associated with it that will set the bit. 
and then we uh, keep transitioning and eventually we get to a state that's an accepting state but it's not an unconditional accepting state now we check the value of the bit so we don't accept if we just see a cd that's not followed uh, th that's not preceded by an ab because the bit wouldn't have been uh, set so uh, the gain is not w if, you, if you look at a single automaton but the gain is uh, when you uh, look at uh, multiple automata again i'm simplifying and when you when you combine them then you don't get the state space explosion. So single automaton, in this case, is not even smaller. But when you combine them, you don't get the state space explosion. Uh, but you get a, a nice automaton who, whose size is, is linear in the number of uh, signatures that you combine. Now, let me, let me just, just uh, say a few words here about how this combination operation works. So we are, we are combining two things. We have the underlying DFAs, and then we have these programs associated with states. Now, in, in, in our system, the programs and the variables in scratch memory do not affect at all transitions in any way. They only affect acceptance decisions. So we combine the underlying DFAs just as, as you would combine normal DFAs. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's a very simple, well-known, well well-understood operation. Now, what do we do with the programs? Uh, well, each state uh, is, in the combined automaton, is uh, a reflection of two states in the two automata you combine, and all you have to do is to just concatenate the two programs. Uh, with, with an extra twist that you may have to rename some variables. If both have a variable called bit, then you will call one of them bit1 and the other one bit2. But there's absolutely no interaction because they work on different variables, and all you do is concatenate the programs. Uh, and, well, if there's an empty program, then your program that you can bind with is, is, is just the same. So, um, and uh, any questions about why or how this works before we move on to another example? So the, the intuition behind this is that you're trying to basically save, if you have multiple regular expressions, save subsets of them that match from more regular expressions on other for these variables. Yes. So that come back is that is that the intuition of this of this yes so, so of the, basically we are dividing the word bit work between dfas and then these extra variables uh, and, and this 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 memory uh, and and the programs and we are using the, the the automata for things they are good at like recognizing chunks of regular expressions and we are using bits for things they are uh, bits and, and well counters for things they are good at like uh, tracking things that happen independently, and those can be mixed uh, very cheaply if, if you just have independent bits. But, but if you have automata where, where things happen independently and can be interleaved arbitrarily, then, then that causes to state space explosion. So just separating the two and then using more the structure of, of, of the underlying computation. I'm not 100% sure, but it looks like here, if you were to say, just treat those bits as um, if you were to take the bits out of state space yes. and just add them back into your dispatch tables, you would then exactly have the standard combination of the whole flat automata, correct? So right, right, right now, if I were to say every place where there's a decision made on the bit, yes. and I was to imagine just sort of making the, the transition tables in memory now larger to reflect what's the state of bit one and what's the state of bit two, that's, that's exponential. I agree. It, but my question is, is it exactly isomorphic to the, the standard exponentially large thing? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, not, 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 not that way. Uh, so so, 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 so the, the way, the, the way I, I would say it's, it's uh, isomorphic is that the state of the computation is, is this pointer to the current state and the collection of, of, of all the bits. And now, now your transitions uh, update one part of it and then update the other part of it. But, but, uh, but by representing the two separately, uh, we can represent things much more compactly. Okay. And, and then actually later in the compiler, when, when I get to the, the, the compiler, you can see that these updates to these bits uh, all throughout the compiler are on transitions, just like the uh, updates to the state variable, not, not on states. But it's, it's more efficient to implement it, associating uh, things with states, not with uh, transitions, because there's much fewer states than transitions. So when you talk about 
talking about saving the memory, are you mostly talking about saving the memory of the tables, the, the program, or saving the memory and the states? Because it seems like the memory of the states is going to be about the same, but the programs are going to get a lot of the, the transition tables slash programs are going to be all the same. So the, the, the state of the computation, which is the per flow state you need to save between one packet or another, uh, is, is, is not it's getting reduced usually, uh, but, but that's not the significant reduction. The, the size of the data structure, which includes uh, the automaton states, the programs, all that, that gets uh, reduced significantly. Okay, so let's look at another example. That's not as bad, but still, still important in practice. If we have a signature like, like, like this one where we are looking for, and this is uh, typical for, for uh, buffer overflows. We are looking for a new line followed by a keyword, well, which in this case is just the letter uh, A, uh, followed by 200 non-new lines. Uh, then, then, well, this is the automaton with some transition submitted <laughs> that will recognize that. And, and in itself, it's, it's, it's inefficient because it just uses 200 states to just count how many non-new line characters have I seen after the keyword. But when it gets combined with, with, with a well-behaved string matching automaton, it gets even worse because that string matching automaton gets, gets replicated because that string can occur in any offset in, uh, after, after this command. So actually, we have k n squared states for answer signatures where k is this number, this uh, number that's inside the integer uh, range uh, constraint, so, so how, how, how much we count to it. Now with XFAs, we, we can use instead a counter, and it, it, it's a, a, a bit trickier than the other one, but, but, but it works. Uh, so if we see a new line followed by an A, then we initialize the counter to zero. And then we would normally come back to the state k and keep uh, just staying in that state, and then whenever we, we move back to that state, we increment the counter, we check if the counter reached uh, 200, and if so, we raise an alert. That's not the whole story. That, that wouldn't give us the correct semantics, because what if we see a new line? So actually, we have to add uh, an, a counter invalidation uh, program to, to, to the state that, that comes after seeing a new line, and now this has exactly the correct semantics. It recognizes uh, new lines followed by A's, followed by 200 non-new uh, non lines. And it has exactly the same shape as an automaton recognizing the string new line followed by an A. And when we combine it to another string matching automaton, we have this, uh, this uh, again, this nice shape of, of automata that just uh, recognize strings. Uh, the, the, the programs get uh, copied in different places. And if you look at state K, R there, that's, that's the first instance of an example where the programs from, from the two states that are combined are non-empty, and then we actually have a concatenation. So we're incrementing the counter and checking and accepting signature one if it's 200, but we're also unconditionally accepting signature two because we have uh, just, just seen a BC. So, and, and this is, this is uh, linear in, in, in the number of signatures we combine. So the, the core idea is to just take automata with, with, and add these extra variables, put them in a scratch memory. And um, it, it, it works because it allows, allows us to change the shape of the automata in a way that doesn't cause explosion. And then these extra variables, they don't cause explosion because you, we just concatenate the programs and we, we just concatenate the scratch memories, basically, when we combine uh, automata. So that's, 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 uh, that's, that's the core idea behind uh, what we do behind these XFAs. Uh, okay. Uh, how, how arbitrary those programs can be? Like uh, those variable maintenance things? So uh, for, for, uh, for now, we use uh, bits and counters, and we have instructions for setting bits, resetting bits, testing bits, uh, incrementing counters, invalidating counters, testing counters, and that's, that's, that's all we needed to, to, to get uh, where we are. But you, you may... Uh, you may find some other instructions useful or some other data structures uh, useful if you're at, at different signature sets than what, what we had. So, so, in, um, okay. um, so, so in theory, these XFAs can recognize more than regular expressions? No. Yeah, if you ask a theoretician, this, this, this doesn't recognize anything more than regular expressions because we have finite state. Uh, the, the, the number of variables we have is finite. There are finite counters. So the state of the computation is finite, just, just like with DFAs. Now, if you ask a practitioner, then, then, then well, you know, a counter counting, uh, you know, a 64-bit counter, 
is very different from an automaton with two to the 64th states. So, so in, in practice, it allows you to do things that you wouldn't normally do with regular expressions. But, but from a theoretic point of view, it, it, it still strictly recognizes only regular languages because the state of the computation is finite. It's just better structured. And, and there's structure there in, 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 in the, the, the signature sets that, that we looked at and that people use for in, intrusion uh, premansion. Okay, so, so my theory is really weak, but um, just because, just because like, the state is finite means that does, that one, does one follow from the other, that any program that has finite state would only recognize regular languages? Is that what you just said? Or? Yes, because if, if it has finite state, then you can just represent it with, with, with trend. Well, if it has finite state and it goes through these input right. bytes one by one, which, which, which we do, then you can represent any change in the state of the program as a transition. So, and of course, theoreticians say, well, you have counters. So if you give me two infinite counters, then I have a Turing machine. Sure. Yeah, but these are not infinite counters. Oops, these are, these are, these are just finite counters. So, so, so to the theoreticians, this is regular expression matching and regular languages. It, it cannot do anything more than that. Okay, so uh, let me tell you about a couple of uh, the things we had to do to, to, to uh, demonstrate this in practice. First, well, we need to handle regular expressions that are very different from these uh, simplified examples that, that, that illustrate well what we do, but, but uh, uh, are maybe, uh, well, are a lot cleaner than what we see in practice. Then we need a, a compiler, actually, uh, to, to take us from regular expressions to XFAs because we, we don't want to be building these by hand. And actually, it turns out that there's, there's uh, a lot of mileage we can get out of optimizations on the combined XFA because this structure allows us to, to uh, optimize away things uh, that, that uh, help us with performance and memory usage. So, I'm just, just curious. So essentially, you pose <coughs> XFAs as you know, DFAs plus auxiliary variables. Yes. So, but and I guess you're still um, in to <coughs> the, the intent of the is to have as compact encoding of the states as possible. Yes. Right. So of, 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 yeah, of the data. Yes. Also, data, yes. Uh, but essentially, if you replace a DFAs with, say, you know, non deterministic finer arguments, yes. which have maybe a processing gets increased, or, but essentially, you, exactly. you get, do you actually get better encoding using them? Or essentially, what, are the, what is the trade off? Or is it as simple as just replacing the DFA with an NFA? So, 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 well, I, uh, the, the, the NFAs are, are much more compact. They are, they are quicker to build, but matching is slow. So, so what, what we have is a single DFA for the entire signature set that matches the signature set. And you pay the cost of a few instructions uh, for, for the programs. Whereas with NFAs, if you do a, a breadth-first traversal, then you are in many states at any given time, and y y your update gets complicated. Or if you do backtracking, then, then, well, you can repeat a lot of work because of backtracking, or you can just do a lot of extra work because of the backtracking, even if it's uh, useful work. So matching is, uh, one, slower and, 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 and uh, often uh, less uh, deterministic in terms of the time it takes to go it through the input. The because I mean, I can see that there'll probably be a trade-off at some point in time that if, if the DFA becomes too large, um, Essentially, if your signatures become more complex, then at some point, then you actually may want to use an NFA instead of a DFA. So, in some sense, uh, this 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 original picture uh, uh, here, uh, I shouldn't go back this way. Okay, the, uh, if you look at the the, the corner for separate uh, DFA for each signature, that's like an NFA. Where, where, where it, it, it's, it's in parallel in, in all these states for the different signatures, and you have an epsilon transition to the start states from, from a common start state. So that's, that's an NFA. So, so uh, of course, for NFAs, there are many types of NFAs you can build for a signature. So it's not like with DFAs where you have the minimal one. But it, it, the way to think about it, NFAs are that, that, that lower right uh, corner, pretty much. And... Um, Okay. So I can figure it out. Should we build a pro regular expression engine this point too? Using the XFAs? Uh, or is this for routers only? Or why is this for routers? Why is this for routers? <sighs> okay, so 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 the, the, the 
Well, regular expression library is actually used in intrusion prevention systems, and, and it's, it is uh, an NFA-based uh, approach that uses backtracking. Now, uh, there, there are a couple of uh, advantages uh, we have. So, so one advantage is that we can, we, we don't, have, with, with PCRE, uh, that's, that's the library, yeah. if you combine the, 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 the regular expressions with a big OR, then, then it gets uh, probably very slow. And, and you have to match them separately. And, and then, then you pay the time, the, the, the cost of matching the signatures uh, separately. So that's, that's our advantage. Their advantage is that uh, it's very quick to match. So we go through some work in the determinization, building exaface, combining exaface, before we can match. So in many settings where, where, where you would use regular expressions, you don't want to spend a lot of time optimizing and combining things. You just want to, uh, you know, a quick match, and maybe you will be using that regular expression just once. And then another uh, advantage so, so that it has... It's also a size of the of the. It's also a function of the size of the input of the data. Of the no, data. it's it's a function of, of how many regular expressions you have and how complicated your regular expressions uh, are. So so basically, we exploit the fact that we can spend a lot of time. Uh, actually, it's not that much, but we can spend time on trying to get to a signature that allows fast matching. They have to care uh, much more about the time it gets uh, it takes to get to a representation where they can do matching. Plus, they have all types of bells and whistles that, 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 that we don't have. So in many practical applications, you need those. So, so it's, it's, it's not ready to replace uh, them. But in an intrusion prevention system where you look for this high throughput processing, I would argue that this is, this is what you want. Oops, oh, already been here, sorry. Okay, so uh, let's see. Uh, with with uh, general regular expressions, uh, we have uh, two, uh, well, we have one big problem. How does the compiler know when to use bits and uh, counters? And actually, this is the question about introducing bits and counters in, in, in the front end of the compiler. Uh, so um, for integer, uh, for, for counters, it's easy because uh, there's, there's a giveaway that there's this integer range uh, notation, which is a syntactic sugar on the original uh, syntax, but it's used extensively. So whenever we see something like that, it means between M and N repetitions, then, then we insert uh, a counter. For bits, it's a bit more uh, complicated. We introduced a parallel concatenation operator that we insert in the regular expressions. And it's the same as the normal concatenation operator. And um, it's the same in, in, in terms of semantics, but it introduces a bit in the construction. And what we are trying to do with this parallel concatenation operator is to break the regular expression into chunks that, that are more string-like. Uh, and uh, we... Um, we have some heuristics that do this for like three quarter of the signatures and then for 15% uh, of the signatures we have to adjust the insertion of this operator manually and uh, so we cover roughly 90% of the uh, signatures in the um, data sets that we, that we looked at. So here are some examples. So for example, if we have, uh, and these are actual uh, regular expressions from SNORT, the open source uh, intrusion uh, prevention uh, system that's, that's most widely used. So the first regular expression looks for ping.asp that can be preceded by a slash or a backslash. It's not exactly one string, it's, it's two possible strings, but for, for us it's close enough to string matching that we don't introduce a parallel concatenation operation. The second one is exactly the, 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 the type of signatures that, that we have seen, a first string followed by a second string. So the first string is, is BAT double quotes and the second string is the ampersand sign. So this we break into two before the second uh, dot star by, by inserting this parallel concatenation operator, which doesn't change the semantics, but it, it tells the compiler to insert uh, a bit. The last one is, is, is similar to the expression that caused the, the polynomial uh, blow up. So new line followed by a keyword followed by 300 repetitions of non-new lines. Now this is um, not obviously string-like, but, but for, for our compiler, having a character class such as non-new line 
uh, that's very large is the same as having a dot. And having 300 repetitions gives us the same shape of automaton as, 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 as the closure that looks for an, an arbitrary number of repetitions. So we insert the parallel concatenation operator before this uh, large number of repetitions because that's, that's like the beginning of another dot star string. So that's, that's how we, uh, yes. The rule number, that's, that's just the identifier uh, that, that Snort gives to these rules. Snort. Yes, 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 yes. And then that's, if, if it's configured as an intrusion detection system, then it will log rule number, blah, alert it, or something like that. So, so actually, uh, we're, we're still working on, on a theory that would allow us to fully automate this step. And, and uh, we have a lot of intuition about what causes state space explosion and what, what, what doesn't, but, but we need to, to make some progress uh, on, on a theory to be able to uh, make principled and informed decisions about how to, how to break these uh, regular uh, expressions. Okay, uh, the next step is compiling a regular expression to an XFA. And uh, this is the only slide where uh, I have a non-deterministic automaton on, on, uh, on the slide. And inside the compiler, of course, we use non-deterministic uh, XFAs. So what do they have? They have a set of states. They have a data domain, which for our compiler is this unstructured set. So uh, for example, it's, it's, it's 0, 1, 2. So uh, if we have a data domain that can have four values, you know, the compiler most of the time doesn't know whether those should be you know, two bits that can be set or set independently, or a counter that can count from 0 to 3, or a counter that can be invalidated, and then it can count from 0 to 2. So it's, it's, it's all abstracted away. It, it's just a set. It's just a set of uh, values for the data domain. Uh, we have an input alphabet. We have a non-deterministic transition relation. Uh, we have an update relation for the data domain. So, so inside the compiler, actually, we update this, this data domain, the, the value of the data domain, on the transitions. And it's, it's uh, a non-deterministic relation. Uh, and later, it gets determinized. And we don't just have an initial state. We have an initial configuration, because now the state of the computation is the pointer to the automaton state and the value in the data domain. So state k and the value has to be 0. And for acceptance, we just don't have an accepting state, but a set of accepting configurations. So we accept in state n if the value of the data domain is 2. So uh, we use these, these uh, NXFAs and go through the normal uh, steps of, of, uh, of the construction of the Thompson construction for, for DFAs from regular expressions. So we build the non-deterministic XFA from the parse tree of the regular expression. Then we eliminate the epsilon transitions. Then we have two separate determinization steps, one to determinize the transitions, and another one to determinize these uh, update relations and turn them into update functions. Uh, and we have two steps for uh, minimizing the data domain and the state space, but the one for minimizing the state space is not uh, in, in, uh, implemented in the results I'm going to show. And actually, I put minimize in quotes because we don't have the concept of a canonical minimal XFA like, like there is for DFA, so it's more reducing uh, the data domain. And there's a um, tricky, tricky step at the end. And, and this is one of the things we, we, we would like to get rid of and make progress on. So this is, this is another re uh, reason why, why we're still working on this project. So we have these data domains that, uh, and these update functions uh, that are described as, as sets. But we, what we actually want is uh, efficient programs that would update the data domain and give some structure to that data domain. And we, we, uh, we need to find an efficient implementation of the data domain. So going from this opaque unstructured representation to something efficient. So if you have four values, for example, this step would recognize that for this automaton, I have to use two separate bits. For this other automaton, I have to use a counter that can go from 0 to 3. So there is this last step of, of uh, finding uh, the, right, the right structure for the, for the data domain. And actually, we move the updates to the states because it's, it's, it's more efficient to match uh, that way. But that's, that's an easy step at the end. So I'm not going to go through all these steps. So, uh, but um, I have here uh, examples of, of uh, non-deterministic XFAs that we get uh, during the process. So the one, the one on the right is what we get uh, if we combine expression 1 and expression 2 with parallel concatenation. 
it's, it's similar to having two automata that recognize the two expressions uh, separately. But because we have the bit, it accepts just if, if it sees the second expression before the uh, first expression. And actually, if there are overlaps between them, then, then this still guarantees the correct semantics. So, so it, it, it can handle arbitrary cases even if there are overlaps between the strings that are in the two regular expressions. They're handled correctly. Uh, and the other example is the shape of the automaton that we get uh, if we use this uh, uh, integer range notation to introduce a counter. Okay, uh, let me talk about uh, optimizations. Uh, and actually, there, there, there are two optimizations that, that, that help us um, a lot, if, for some signature sets at least. One is that, it, for the example we saw, uh, we have this counter that we have to increment on every byte of input, pretty much. And that's not a problem, but, but if we combine uh, many signatures like this, uh, uh, 15 signatures like this, then we have 15 counters to increment on every byte. That, that slows down the processing. So can we do it some other way without incrementing the counter on every byte? And what we do is uh, for, uh, for some counters, such as the one uh, used here, we just don't increment them on every character, but instead remember when they would uh, trigger an alert. So we have this global data structure. Uh, think of it as a timer. Uh, and we set an alert in that timer when we would initialize the counter. And then instead of incrementing the counter on every byte, uh, we, we just check to see whether any of these uh, alerts that, that, that we had timers for is, is triggered or no. And uh, then, of course, we remove it from this list uh, when we see a new line. And what we did here is we remove the increment operation from the common state. Now, we still have this operation of, uh, f from state k, which is the state in which the automaton spends most of its time. Now, we still need to check whether there are any timers that expire on the current byte. But that's a scalable operation because that's a single check, and we perform a single check whether we combine 15 signatures or, or whether we have a single signature. It's not like incrementing 15 counters, uh, which is uh, more work as, as, as the number of uh, signatures increases. Yes? It's good work only if all those counters check the same character, right? No. So, so we can have a, a counter that's being invalidated by a new line. We can have a counter that's being invalidated by uh, you know, a space. Uh, or, or, uh, Suppose I have one counter that checks for 200 Ps and another one that checks for 200 Ps. Yes. Then, uh, no, then, then, then this won't work. So if you have, uh, then we wouldn't apply this optimization. So, so this, this applies if you have counters that, that are incremented on most possible input characters. And we don't always apply this optimization for some counters. For example, for some email signatures, you're looking for a certain number of, of uh, certain characters, but, but you know, just very specific characters. So a number of repetitions for the at sign or, or for the percentage sign. And so, so the, the, there we don't, don't, don't use this. Typical, <coughs> typical signatures, how many repetitions do regular expressions specify? So, uh, uh, Hundreds, the two hundreds, really? hundreds and, and there are some that go uh, up, up, up to uh, two or four thousand. So what but example with so many, I mean, what, what, are, what are these signatures looking for, those that contain hundreds of repetitions or something? <laughs> buffer, buffer overflow, yes. So. I guess the uh, question is, why two thousand, why just not leave it for, I mean, no, no, that's why do you, why do you well, that too. so high. Well, if you have a buffer that's two thousand characters, then I then, then then you need at least that many to to, to, to cause trouble. So, we haven't looked very deeply into the into the uh, the reasons behind these signatures, but but uh, uh, we are assuming many of these are buffer overflows, the the, the ones that do the counting. Th this type of counting. Okay, uh, there's another thing we can do. So, so um, there's, a, there's an opportunity because often these counters uh, are, are what we would call mutually exclusive. So if you want to count the number of non-new lines after the hello keyword in, in SMTP, 
And uh, if you want to count the number of non-new lines after another keyword in SMTP, well, you will never be at the same time on a line that had one keyword first and at the same time on a line that had the other keyword first. So those two counters, they are never used at the same time. So what we can do is use actually a single counter and uh, when, when, when the signatures are combined, notice that we can use a single counter to, to, to look for both types of uh, repetitions. So this is the combined automaton uh, for, for not doing this optimization. And if we use a single counter, then the, the only change is really that uh, we have fewer alerts to cancel when we see a new line. And that's actually an important benefit because now it's not as bad as before that we have you know, 15 counters to increment, but after a new line, if we have these uh, separate counters, we have 15 counters to reset. So we are reducing the length of uh, that by, by using this optimization. It's actually more, more, more general. Uh, we have a data flow analysis, and uh, it, it, it's similar to some of the analysis uh, done by compilers. But this is the most important case in which uh, that this, this optimization of, of using the same uh, counter for, for multiple signatures is uh, applicable. It's in some sense similar to what compilers do when you have different variables that use the same register. Uh, they do some analysis, and if they figure out that you can use the same register, then, then they use a single register, and uh, you don't need two registers for two variables that are not used at the same time. Okay, let, let me uh, talk a little bit about uh, our experimental evaluation. And so we used uh, signature sets uh, from uh, Cisco IPS and, and SNORT. Uh, we used FTP, SMTP, and HTTP signatures, which are uh, these text-based protocols where regular expressions are used uh, a lot. There are other protocols also uh, that, that use regular expressions, but we just focused on these three. And we were able to construct XFAs and DFAs for 90% of the uh, signatures. And for, for DFAs, for neither of these signature sets could we fit uh, the, the combined DFA into uh, 3 gigabytes of memory. Actually, I think we also tried with, with 16 gigabytes and it still wouldn't fit. So, so they're way larger, uh, even for uh, you know, the smaller signature set, which has uh, 38 signatures. Uh, for XFAs, the number of automaton states we get is on the order of, uh, well, from, from hundreds to you know, uh, 15,000 uh, uh, 15, states. So that's still uh, a, few, a few megabytes or tens of megabytes of uh, data. So in all cases, we could just produce a single XFA recognizing the entire uh, signature set. Now, uh, yeah. So when you say you, you constructed for 90% of the signature, yes. what, what was the problem for the remaining 10%? Uh, the, the, the problem for the remaining 10% is that uh, our, our compiler, um, uh, the problem for the remaining 10% is that they were different from, from the others. We haven't picked uh, you know, the hard or the easy ones. Uh, and uh, for our compiler, we have that last step when we need to add the structure to the data domain. And we would, there would be just, just many variations on, 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 on bits and counters. And uh, it's, uh, so, so, so for, for the most common shapes of signatures, uh, we went through the manual work of, of, of building descriptions for those uh, structures for the data domains. But it's, it's, it's a manual step. So, so when, when we got to these signatures that are not exactly like the other signatures, it, it's just a lot of work for solving the last 10% of, 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 of the problem. So, so we, we stopped there. And well, we, we decided that it's better to, to, to try to come up with an automated compiler as opposed to just uh, pushing this uh, through 100%. Through it's, it's not a fundamental limitation of the idea of using XFAs. It's just our compiler is not uh, automated enough to, 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 to do things on, uh, on its own entirely. What do you think? Actually, so for me, column when you say they actually have a large memory footprint. So that, does that mean that the current IDEA systems don't actually even do the signature matching? Or? Yeah, they, they don't use a single DFA. They use multiple DFAs. Okay, so they have to use multiple DFAs. Or some things, uh, things other than DFAs. And uh, 
if we have time after uh, half past 11, uh, th th then I will go into a couple of things, uh, a couple of other ideas that are being used and, and their pros and cons. Uh, okay, so we compare against multiple DFAs and multiple DFAs with compressed transition tables, which is something that has been proposed in, in SICOM 2006. And this is the type of uh, results that we get, uh, where the, the, the black uh, uh, crosses, they are just the multiple DFAs, and then the diamonds are the compressed uh, DFAs. Uh, the horizontal axis is the processing time, so the further you are to the right, it means the s slower the solution. And the vertical axis is memory usage, so the higher up you are, the more memory you use. The vertical line there is the execution time of a single DFA, which is, well, we cannot use that to represent the entire signature set, but we put, there, we put it there for reference. So this is the, the, the data point we get with an XFA uh, before we apply uh, these optimizations, and this is the data point that we get uh, with optimization. So uh, we can see that it's uh, faster and more compact than the solutions we can have uh, based, on, based on multiple DFAs for exactly the same uh, signature set. And this is for Cisco SMTP, which is one of the simpler <coughs> signature sets. Snort HTTP, this is the most complex signature set we looked at. And uh, again, the axes are on log scale. So the differences here, these are a factor of 50 in memory uh, consumption and the factor of almost 10 in, in speed up. Now, why are we faster? We are not faster than the blue line. So we're not faster than a single DFA because we do what the DFA does plus run some little programs. But if we compare against something that can recognize the same complex signature set, which in this case is, is this 40 some DFAs, uh, and they use much more memory, then we are faster than, than, than a bunch of DFAs. We are not faster than, a, than an individual DFA, but uh, we, are, we are faster than the current solution, which is that of using multiple DFAs. So these cycles, this is for uh, like the commodity Pentium? Yes, this is for a commodity Pentium, and, and so uh, m many of, of the existing intrusion prevention systems don't run on commodity Pentium, uh, but, but this is something we could, we could uh, measure that would uh, give us um, an idea. And well, if you use something faster, than, or if you use something specialized, then the, then the absolute numbers change, but, but we expect to see the same types of curves. In cycle times, or is the difference primarily sort of fresh in the memory hierarchy because the memory size of the transition tables are so much bigger? It's, uh, it's hard to say from these numbers, but, but uh, our suspicion is that a lot of it is uh, because of memory excesses also. Because these, these are large uh, data structures, and, and there, is, there is some locality, there are some popular states, but every now and then you go outside popular states, and th that, that's a very slow operation. So things that we do, such as uh, incrementing, uh, manipulating a few bits and counters that are relatively easy to, to, to cache, uh, we assume that, that that actually doesn't generate as much uh, memory traffic as looking up uh, many transition tables. And even if you have a cache hit ratio of, uh, I don't know, uh, 90%, if you have 50 automata, then you know, two out of, uh, uh, how many? Five out of 50. We we still require slow memory accesses, and 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 that that, that we speculate that that's, that's 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 part of the reason. It's a combination of both, but uh, well, it's hard to say from 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 the numbers. We well, have. The question is: so the cycles is not actually you know, operations executed, or you know, that's that's Pentium or? Pentium performance counter cycles, yeah. okay. and. We, we are not counting uh, f for the alerts themselves. We have a null routine, so we are, we are not spending any time on, on you know, logging or anything like that. And we, we are not counting the time to read in the input. So that's, that's what our methodology was. So uh, let me uh, summarize. Uh, so regular expression matching is a performance critical problem for, uh, for deep packet inspection and specifically for intrusion prevention systems, but for other uh, systems that do deep packet inspection also. And the state space explosion leads to uh, memory problems that translate to, to, to runtime uh, throughput problems with DFAs because you have to go to more than one DFA. And XFAs extend these DFAs with auxiliary variables. And 
the effect of that is that we tame the state space explosion by having underlying DFAs that uh, don't uh, interact uh, adversely. And uh, where we are now is that we need more work to fully automate the construction of XFAs, but we are able to build uh, a, a prototype uh, with 90% with a, a, a of the signatures that, that uh, convinced us that uh, XFAs uh, can outperform uh, multiple DFAs in both uh, matching uh, and uh, memory usage. So, yes? So I have a question about how, like, how about this compilation step, like how hard yes. is this in fact? Like if you take a smart guy like Sweet here, how do you take him to actually <laughs> do this thing? Uh, the, 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 the compilation step? Yeah, I mean, so think of you, like for a, for a company, right? So a company can actually throw the snore thing with whatever the regular expression engine that they're using that right now, and it's slower, but it's just, you know, they press a button and it will work. Or they can do this stuff that, I understand it can be automatic, but it's not right now. So how, how hard is to do this? To actually, to actually combine all these regular expression into this structure? So the hard part is, is not the combination. So when we combine regular expressions for five out of the six signature sets, uh, combining from individual XFAs is less than a minute, including all optimizations. For the most complex signature set, it's seven minutes. And this is just combining them one by one. So, so we can do... to insert those hash signs and all that. Now, now that, so, so combining the XFAs, that's the easy part. Building the XFAs, that's, that's, that's the hard part. And, and uh, with, with, with our uh, current tools uh, for... Uh, 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 I don't know off the top of my head the exact numbers, but uh, no, it's, it's very close to 85% of the signatures that we compile are uh, under 10 seconds. At the same time, like signatures, I would imagine, they have a long lifetime and get used widely. It's like if somebody were to count the signature, if, if combination is easy, somebody needs to do it once manually and then... That's it. Just keep using it, right? That's 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 one argument to make. Uh, but but if, if if they don't buy that, then then then, th then we have to come up with a compiler that that that, that works uh, for for more signatures. What I meant to say, sometimes lack of automation can be a deal breaker. Yes, it, uh, for intrusion prevention, it is not. Right. It well, like, we uh, we don't think it should be, but but you know, well, Cisco may disagree. Uh, and, 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 the, and, and the other comment uh, is that in, in, in some other settings where you, where you have automated systems coming up with signatures and, and you want the, the user to, to insert for application identification often, you, you give more freedom for the user to insert things that they want to recognize. There, it's, it, it's more important to, to, to have a fully automated way of going from, from uh, these f frequently updated uh, signatures to, 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 to an XFA representation. So, uh, okay, since, 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 since we have uh, more time, I can go through a couple of other ideas that have been used. And actually, this, this, this idea of separating the variables uh, from, from the automata, uh, we think that in, in a real system, it would be used in combination with a couple of other ideas that, that have been out there. So, uh, let's just go through a couple of extra topics here. Uh, the first one is exploiting hardware parallelism. Uh, the second one is slow path, fast path. Uh, this, is, this is what SNORT uses. Uh, Non-deterministic automata and compressing transition tables. So uh, if we have you know, multiple signatures to match against, against the input, then, then we can do this in parallel if we have parallel hardware. And people who do FPGA-based solutions or, or, or build uh, integrated circuits, they can have as much parallelism as, as, as they want and, and have work uh, be done in parallel. Now, this, uh, so, so uh, the advantage is that the area increases linearly with the number of signatures and there's no slowdown as the number of signatures increases. But what happens is if you have too many signatures and uh, people would argue that we haven't reached that too many point, uh, then you know, the power consumption goes up because you have all these uh, microcontrollers or, or cores working in parallel and uh, the per flow state uh, gets, gets very large. So imagine that you have you know, 500 microcontrollers each with their own state pointer 
uh, if you have a single automaton, then just you have a single state pointer. If you have you know, 500 uh, automaton matching in parallel, then you can't even broadcast something to them. You, you, you need to add these, these uh, state pointers one by one and then remove them after you're done with the packet. So the, the throughput, if you're just looking at a stream, is OK. But if you need to context switch and, and, and you'll save the per flow state, then, then that becomes a more expensive uh, operation with these types of approaches. I would assume in most real workloads you'd be wanting to compare multiple flows rather than just a single flow? Multiple flows uh, rather than a single flow. So exactly. The, the other point is that if you have this uh, parallelism available in hardware, then, then wouldn't it be better to have a solution that works with a single automaton and instead of you know, using uh, 50 cores to, to match one packet, use the 50 cores to match 50 separate packets and increase your throughput that way? No, it, I, it might be more efficient to process flows in serial and process each individual one in parallel. I don't know. Is, is anyone opinion? Uh, so, so um, w w what happens is, is, is uh, you often get uh, these, these, these papers that um, look, look at the whole design space and then there, there's a cost of, of uh, working on different packets because then you need different local buffering. They cannot use the same buffer. Uh, so so it's, it's, it's hard to, to, to tease apart the, 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 the whys. But, but basically, the, there have been proposals that, that propose using these multiple uh, cores to work on the same input, and there have been proposals that just use these separate cores and the hardware parallelism to work on different inputs in parallel. It's, it's more expensive to work on uh, multiple inputs uh, in parallel than it is to work on the same input and then have, have multiple processing units work on it. Uh, and, uh, but again, this is something that, that, that uh, has been proposed and it, it, it is useful, so for example, in an XFA-based system, if, if our compiler is, is, is not good enough, we can still uh, have one XFA and then uh, a bunch of uh, DFAs that would, that would run in parallel. And that would be a better solution than running way too many DFAs in, in parallel. So uh, another solution is uh, a fast path, slow path. And, and, and there are many variants of this. Snort is using uh, this extensively. So you can break the signature into something simple that you can recognize efficiently and where you can combine uh, the, the, the signatures, uh, such as string matching. And that's exactly what Snort does. And then if you see a string that must be there for the signature to match, then you go through uh, a slow path that would actually check everything, not just, not just string matching. So you don't alert whenever you see that string. You get the good semantics. But most of the time, you don't do the expensive uh, matching. So typically, uh, the way it works is you combine these these fast path representations, but then you match individually these slow path representations that give you the semantics you want. Are, are you know if needed? Uh, uh, don't you want to keep back straight down? I mean, suppose it's with that uh, back followed by star hand that you showed, right? So presumably back is the string you could look for on the fast path. And then, but then you need to know what passed before. So you have to hold on to some of the data that went before to actually raise an alert. Yes, 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 yes. So, so, so you can do this if you have all the data. You do the fast path pass first, and then you may need to come back. And then how do you know if needed? Well, in the Snort signature language, it, it tells you, you know, these strings. And then uh, if the string doesn't occur, then, then, then uh, the signature cannot match. So uh, for example, the keyword was, I don't know, describe. You look for the string describe. If the string describe is not there in the input, then you cannot see a new line followed by a describe followed by 500 non-new lines. So, uh, so, so you're essentially breaking individual signatures. You're not saying, OK, these signatures are really slow. I'm going to put them in the slow path. Because no, 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 no. You're breaking individual signatures. And that's, that's, that's a very good, that, that's a very good uh, technique. So, so our... our uh, gripe uh, with, with this approach is that uh, it's, it's open to algorithmic complexity attacks, which is uh, the problem is not that it's, it's uh, algorithmic complexity attacks can happen, but, but that people don't really look at how bad they can be. So, so obviously, if you have this fast path, slow path, then by, by triggering the slow path more often than with, with uh, normal traffic, you can slow it down. But, but people proposing these types of approaches don't really try to break their own scheme and see how vulnerable it is. So I don't think it's, it's, it's uh, well, some of them. Okay. So, so, so 
I, I, I don't say this is a bad idea, but, but if you have such a system, then, then uh, we would argue that the best way to build it is to have some, some quantification for how much it can be slowed down by someone who adversarially tries to trigger the slow path. And, and there are things you can do to make it hard to trigger the slow path very, uh, very often. Uh, but but uh, it's, it's uh, not always done. So uh, another thing uh, that, that's used is, is uh, non-deterministic finite automata. And they are very compact. Uh, you can build them quickly. Uh, but uh, you need more processing when you match them. So if you do this breadth first, it's similar with having the multiple DFAs. If you do a depth first traversal of the state space, then backtracking can get you in trouble. And again, you can have uh, algorithmic complexity attacks. And the result is that uh, for actual IPS signatures, we are able to slow them down by six orders of magnitude just by giving them inputs that, that cause them to backtrack. So this is actual snort signatures that I'm talking about. So, so, uh, Uses, for example, in court, notion of backtracking using absolute So, so, uh, so, so we, we, we had some earlier work that, that looked at backtracking, but not inside NFAs, but, but, but inside Snort's uh, language for, for, for uh, signatures, which is a predicate based complex language. And what we did there is we, we slowed it down by. Uh, a million and a half by, by, by triggering backtracking. And then if we applied some dynamic programming techniques, uh, memoization specifically, then that slowdown went away because we could check uh, and, and not do work that wasn't uh, necessary. So backtracking, an adversary, if, if you do backtracking uh, in a simple-minded way, then you can redo work that you did previously that, that ultimately led to failure. And you just repeat because you don't keep enough memory of, of what you did. Now, if you do this dynamic programming where you remember that if I try this from this input, uh, fr from this position in the input, it will lead to failure, then, then you can cut down very much on the power of, uh, of, of these algorithmic complexity attacks. Now, uh, I don't know how easy it is to integrate that with PCRE, you know, with a given library, which is relatively messy. But uh, it's, it's, it's a solution that, that, that worked for the specific backtracking exploit that we looked at. OK, and the other thing is compressing transition tables. This is what we com uh, compared against. Uh, there are all types of methods of compressing these large transition tables with 256 characters. And, and uh, we can notice that many characters are treated the same by all states, or that transition tables for different automaton states are similar, and then use these similarities. Uh, and you can get uh, pretty far with, 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 easy, uh, with, with simple things. Uh, a factor of, of uh, 10, 20 is, is, is probably easy to achieve without complicating very much the uncompression you need to do when you do matching. But uh, it's, it's, it's hard to go uh, past that. And, uh, uh, but uh, we want to point out here that this is an orthogonal uh, solution to what we have to XFAs. So we could actually further reduce the memory usage of the DFA underlying the XFA by applying some of these uh, techniques for uh, transition compression. Uh, another solution where, uh, where uh, another problem where uh, compressed transition tables are being applied is this multi-byte matching, uh, which is a problem I, I, I didn't talk about in the main part of the talk. If you want to take not one byte at a time, but two bytes at a time, then you have an alphabet of, of 65,536 characters because you're looking at two bytes at a time, or even larger. So for these alphabets, uh, this uh, Compression techniques, uh, they work, they work uh, better than for smaller alphabets, but still, uh, you cannot take too many bytes because uh, they get overwhelmed. So, uh, and that's, that's the last of my uh, extra uh, slides. So, so if you have questions, then I'm, I'm, I can answer them. If, if not, then we can end here.